welcome back to everyone and uh, welcome to everybody who wasn't here before. Um, I'm Lilia Mankwa, to everybody who does not know me yet. I'm the host of the stage today and will be taking you through the rest of the day. I hope you all had a nice little break or a lot of input at the other workshops and panels you've all attended. Um, so, let's just get right back into it because we already have our nice panelists, panelists sitting just here. Um, I hope all of you feel good because we're now going to talk about a topic that might not make people feel all too good. It's going to be about <laughs> climate change and uh, climate reporting for engaged audiences. Alexandra Borchardt is on the stage. <laughs> she is lead, the lead author of the EBU News Report 2023 on climate journalism that works between knowledge and impact. We also have Ruan Amaya, journalist, speaker, PhD scholar, investigative, journal, investigative reporter, and first Nigerian journalist nominated for an Emmy Award and manager, Africa Initiative at the Solutions Journalist Network, and Peter Schneering, former consultant to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Secretariat in Bonn and the International Energy Agency in Paris. He's also the founder of the nonprofit think tank Future Clean Tech Arch Architects. And from the Bonn Institute, we have Lisa Urbauer, head of journalism training at the Bonn Institute and expert on local and solutions journalism. I hope you all have a nice panel and um, see you after that. Thank you, Lilia, for introducing us. So I can just put away my first card here because you all know us now. And uh, we want to talk today about how we can navigate complexity in covering the climate crisis and especially when we want to talk about solutions to the climate crisis and how we can strike a balance between being accessible to our audiences while also being accurate about the facts that are often very, very complex and hard to understand, stand even for the scientist, for the journalist, and especially for the audience. So I'm very much excited for our panel here. We have journalists, researchers, and also a clean tech expert who's closely working with journalists. So I'm really looking forward to this, also like a bit of outside perspective on our profession. And Alexandra, as the lead author of the 2023 EBU report on Climate journalism will start us off with some data and numbers and what the current state of climate reporting and our audiences is. Yes, thank you so much, Lisa, and uh, thank, thanks all to all of you because the, the fact that you're here means that you must have skipped lunch or just had a very tiny bite because this is right around lunchtime now, so where everyone else is in the restaurants around, you are here to learn about uh, yeah, one of the biggest, or maybe the, the, the biggest challenge that we are facing. Climate journalism that works between knowledge and impact, we consciously uh, chose that title because actually journalists have always been very good good in conveying knowledge and facts, or at least they, they, they hopefully uh, have been good at that, but uh, not really in terms of measuring the impact what uh, their journalism actually achieves. And with the subject like climate change, where it so much matters how people react to it, how politicians, decision makers, business, uh, business actors react to it, impact is really important. That's why we chose that uh, title. Um, Yes, uh, this is just, uh, uh, this is not for you because you all know this, but this is a slide for your editors, uh, really that, that, you know, climate journalism isn't optional if someone walks around and says, but this is activism. Uh, no, it's not, it's not optional because it's your damn duty uh, to, to inform people uh, so that they can make the right decisions uh, for, for their lives, their children's lives and their communities. So this is really this, a part of the mandate. Um, 
about the report very quickly. Uh, it's a qualitative report. The idea was, the task was uh, to, to, to research how to craft journalism about climate change that resonates with audiences, to be very practical, very applied. We have case studies in there, 11 uh, of that. We have resources in there, like literature recommendations, resources you can uh, draw on, a glossary, what every editor needs to know about climate uh, change, if someone really needs a shortcut through that. And uh, so, so there's a lot of material, and you can download it uh, for free from the, the EBU uh, page. Um, yeah, the audience is media leaders, journalists, and communication professionals. It's really beyond public service, even though the, the, the EBU is, is the largest, world's largest association of public service broadcasters. But it's meant to be very practical for all journalists, media leaders uh, in the world. Yeah, and the sources, we did interviews with more than 40 media leaders, communication professionals, experts, uh, other experts in the, in the field. Uh, we drew on research. Uh, we, we, took, we, we looked at the literature that, that was available. So that was a, a, a pretty big, big effort. And um, actually, I have to... Uh, I have to emphasize that, that this obviously has a Western bias because we are all, uh, this is the three of us, uh, we are all from Western European countries, actually two Germans, one Canadian, uh, two working in Oxford, one based in, in Munich. Um, uh, but we at least put an effort into uh, quoting at least one uh, person from like sort of each continent. So we have someone from India, we have someone from, from Africa, we have someone from Australia. So we are trying, but that you can actually do much more to, to go beyond that and broaden uh, perspectives. Key findings right away, and you see Greta uh, Thunberg here, and there's a reason for that, because what we found is it's really late. The issue has been around for like decades, 30 years, almost 30 years ago, next year will actually be 30 years, I did my PhD in political science in envi on environmental policies, and while it wasn't specifically on climate change, it was on air pollution, and I knew the issue. Every, everything was out there back then, and the, but, but media has really slept through this. Even the literature, the communication literature, communication science on what climate uh, communication works has been out there for at least, uh, there were some valuable books published in 2014, 2015, it's been out there, but newsrooms haven't been using it until, and that's our assumption, until uh, Greta appeared because suddenly editors had kids at home, their teenage kids who said like, oh gee, you know, uh, maybe um, there is something to this when they are going to these protests, maybe we should do something in the newsroom and that's probably the reason. Um, number two, there's too much doom and gloom and too little focus on explanation and solutions and the explanation and solutions, this is obviously constructive journalism, this is what we are uh, here for and we want to zero in on, on that one. Third one, Facts alone don't do it. Facts alone don't do it. You always have to be careful about what kind of messenger you use because the number one finding in climate communications is actually what works for people to change their behavior. It's when peers change their behavior, their peers, like in the community, their neighbors, uh, even, and I tend to joke around this, that, you know, the, the billionaire probably doesn't listen to the, the, the podcast, but, but uh, listens to when the fellow billionaire uh, sells their, his or her private plane and says, like, you know, this is not good for the climate. So maybe, ah, maybe I should do that. So, so really, uh, influencers have an important role uh, on, on this. Um, yeah, then more the, the organizational question. There are too many silos in newsrooms. Uh, climate impact needs to be part of all beat. And as a former business editor, I have to say, particularly the business section really has been very free, uh, entirely free almost of climate coverage for a very long time, even though most industries have a climate strategy already. The media is actually very much behind most industries. And we will learn from someone who's uh, specialized, a pioneer of clean tech, really. We're very excited uh, to, to learn more about that. Uh, so most industries have a climate strategy, but the media uh, don't. Basic climate literacy is a must. That's also what the report is for. Very important in every case, uh, all kinds of journalism, there's no one-size-fits-all model. Every newsroom has to develop their own uh, model. And last but not least, um, you can't... Yet now I know what this is. The, the, the shelf is in the 
it's, it's in the way of the screen, so there's a shadow on this, but you can probably still uh, read it. The media has a hard time living up to their own standards. What does, do I mean with that? This is not only the case for uh, climate reporting, but there's all these editorials, commentaries about how politicians have to craft climate strategies and the economy and the fossil fuel lobby. But if the media organization itself doesn't have a strategy how to cut their carbon footprint, people at some point will say, hey, you know, you're, you're preaching here, but what are you actually doing? It's a matter of credibility that media needs to have uh, climate strategies. This we pulled out from, from the uh, Reuters Institute in Oxford, where I used to work. Um, and, and this is uh, just, you don't have to go into all the uh, categories, but these are the reasons why people avoid news about uh, climate change. And there are tons of reasons, as you can see here, uh, because it's complex, because it leads to polarization, uh, because it's so, so negative. And even reporters who work on the climate beat say, wow, this really gets to you after a while. It can be really, really depressing. And also, uh, people are very often felt like, you very often feel they can't do anything about it. So lots of reasons why people avoid using a climate change done by the colleagues in Oxford. Um, I just put out this one uh, quote. Uh, this, is a this has a reason, Matt Winning. He's an environmental economist and he does stand-up comedy. And one day he decided, why don't we merge this? Because, and I love this quote, because actually isn't this the case that we have to make content for people we don't make content for. This means we make lots of content for the educated, for, for you know, people from NGOs, for people in the, in the green bubble, so to speak, who read that content anyway, but are we really making content for people we don't make content for? And uh, yeah, he explained to us that sometimes after his show, people linger, they hang around, and they walk up to him and say, oh, you know, we, we don't fly in our holidays any longer because, you know, this was impressive, uh, what you said, and we were in the show last time. And he says he really has an impact then. So, so really important, think about the people you don't reach and, and how to make content for them. These five recommendations I picked right away uh, from Max Boykov, Professor Maxwell Boykov works at the University of Colorado. Uh, they're doing an, an environmental uh, uh, studying, they've been studying environmental uh, journalism, climate journalism for, for a long time. And uh, he had just 15 minutes for an interview and I, I said like, okay, 15 minutes, give me what really works in climate journalism. And these five points I just picked right there. Stories that focus on the here and now, so don't make it something that's going to happen in the future, but look what the effects are right there. Stories with local context, what happens in Bonn, and you know, what, what is the, when, when will Bonn reach net zero, and who contributes it? There are great series and, and, and examples uh, what, what people have, uh, newsrooms have done in terms of portraying local heroes in climate change or whatever. Stories that emphasize the benefits of change. Very often there's this language around, oh, it's costly. Remember the heating debate, cost, sacrifice, victim, destruction. Um, you know, all these words that make people feel really bad, not only about themselves, but about government, about everyone, about others. But aren't there actually also positive uh, effects of climate policies like be uh, sustainable uh, cities, better air quality, healthier people, uh, different lifestyles, and maybe even different economic models that we can go to when we seriously think about how to measure growth. Yeah, stories where people find agency, and that's a, a very solutions-oriented approach. And uh, I talked to this one person, she was an ombudsperson for the Netherlands uh, public broadcasting system, and, and she said, well, the, the constructive part, very often that is in, in children's programs, where, where we tell people, children, you know, this is how you can do this experiment, uh, this is how this works, very constructive, whereas in the evening news, people are, we are just glued to our chairs, uh, and, and the bad news are being thrown at us and we feel like, oh, we are the victims of this all. Government has to act and that's a really, really uh, important aspect. And then obviously what modern journalism is all about, approach different audiences, where they are, meet them on the platforms where they are. Um, and these five things are very useful if you just want to have like a shortcut. 
Um, here I just pulled out three case studies that we focused on, uh, three of, of the 11. Uh, I was really, really excited that Norwegian uh, TV really has a strategy, a climate journalism strategy, and in fact not many news organizations do. Uh, she, the, her, their editor in chief sent me this like, oh, would you like to know our strategy? And I was so excited. Actually, someone has a strategy? Great. And um, yeah, and, and Deutsche Welle, they also uh, have a strategy. They are, uh, as you, everyone here probably knows, but for those of you who don't know, Deutsche Welle does, doesn't broadcast in, in Germany, but is very much uh, targeting audiences, particularly young audiences around the world. Um, with very uh, constructive pieces on YouTube and now also on TikTok, lots of explanatory uh, content, and that works very well. And last but not least, uh, what I mentioned here, AFP, Agence France Presse, the, the French news agency, and what they did is they created the future of the Planet Hub. And what does that mean? That means they merged their business uh, business desk with their uh, environment desk. And now uh, all the editors get to read the other texts, they exchange sources, they, they discuss topics together, and this has only been going on for a year, but they said it completely changed their minds. Yeah, and just in the end, uh, if you haven't convinced your editors, because, you know, we, we learn that all the time, it's like, oh, this is expensive, we need to do AI now and invest in this and in that and digital transformation, we haven't even done that yet. You can tell your editors, investing in climate journalism means you invest in your journalism in general because the principles that lead to great climate journalism also will make your journalism much better. Uh, seven reasons, and why is that? Um, number one is that German uh, journalism today is so much uh, stuck in the now, and it's reporting about breaking news. There's too much reported and too little explained. And, and also, it's very much about what's happening now. But young audiences that everyone is craving to attract, they care about uh, tomorrow. They want to really know what will be our future like. And so you should really uh, invest in young audiences and their interest. They are super interested in climate change. And I just taught a workshop on climate journalism at the beginning of the week. And I can tell you, young journalists are super interested in climate journalism. If you want to attract talent uh, among the young, invest in your climate uh, journalism. Then, uh, number two, I don't have to talk about here because it's all about constructive and uh, solutions journalism. If you invest in that, your journalism will get better automatically and the investment will be worth it. Um, number three, it's, it's in climate protection really. Only, it only counts what has been done. Words, quotes, like people who feel like politicians who announce something, you know, uh, fine, uh, that's fine. But what counts is only what has really uh, happened. So journalism needs to focus much more, particularly also political journalism, on data other than on quotes and announcements. And all journalism could profit from focusing more on data. Number four is that climate journalism uh, that works really approaches different audiences at eye level in the language they understand. It needs to be much more inclusive, uh, reach different audiences because really everyone needs to know about climate change and what to do uh, about it. Um, Number five is that climate journalism really needs to be local. And journalism went a strange path there with all the hope that clicks and reach will save journalism because it will bring all this advertising. And you all know that this never materialized. So now news organizations have a hard time, many have a hard time recapturing uh, the local space, but this is their unique point where they can make a difference. And particularly also with local regional news media, uh, they, have, they can really have a strong point focusing on climate because people really want to know. Um, yeah, number six is climate journalism, and this is about the title, needs to have an impact. And to check whether it has an impact, newsrooms need to know, you know, how does our journalism actually affect people? Does it engage audiences? It's not enough to just write this super long read. A, co a colleague of The Guardian uh, told me that, you know, sometimes he sees that there, there are 
long reads published, beautifully written stories, but he can see, he's the data guy, he can see that people drop off after, five, after the first five, ten lines, you know. So really, uh, newsrooms need to focus more on, on data and analytics to, to assess impact, and that also helps with all the other journalism. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, climate journalism is expensive, and that's why, and it's complex, and that's why it's also about collaboration. It's about collaborating um, among news organizations, it's collaborating with external partners for the data. Um, uh, it is very important, and, and I end with uh, collaboration, will be, in this complex world, the new uh, competition. And yes, I have not really ended, but the last uh, quote here is Nanette Brown from the United Nations, and you might all uh, know the quotes by her boss, Antonio, uh, Guterres, who, who always says, like, the world is ending because it's all very, very serious, which it, of course, is. But she says, we want to hook people on hope, not on fear. And I think it's a good thing to, to say at this particular conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexandra, to kind of really, you really gave us a great overview of where we're at right now and what you found out at, with this EBU report. And you, you said it in the beginning very transparently that you had a Western lens in this, um, in this research. Um, so I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to Rona and I wanna ask you, um, so you worked with the Solutions Journalism Network. Today is my last day. <laughs> for, for two years. So and I ran here. You managed the Africa Initiative, so you worked with newsrooms on the African continent on solutions reporting. Yeah. Um, but um, so what? And you're, you're based here in Germany. So what did you learn about journalists when you report from countries that are ob already grappling the most from the climate crisis right now? So how do you report from these countries while keeping in mind cultural differences and nuances? So I think I'm in a very privileged. Um, situation. You're right, I'm based here, but I also go on reporting trips myself. I've actively remained a journalist so I can be a better manager of the 60 newsrooms that we worked with. And, and, and you know, my heritage is my heritage. Um, what I think is very important coming from this German slash African lens is this. When you commission, you know, as Alexandra said, we have to collaborate. So, Germans, Europeans, editors will always commission. So these are a few tips I have. This is also based on um, making climate change uh, courses for journalists across continents and research I've done as well. And what I've found out is that um, you need to recruit when you are hiring or commissioning, you need to recruit people that are believers in climate change. So there are a lot of journalists that do the climate change work, but they don't believe climate change is real. And that comes out in the reports and you end up wasting money, wasting actually the journalist's time. Um, if you do not take the time to see who you're hiring, you will have reports that will not be worth the money. So the very first thing I will say is hire believers. Now, that's the basic thing. They first of all have to think climate change is real, right? then you have to at least um, do some basic climate media literacy. Um, you have to, when you send them out, you have to ask them what are the existing climate change languages. We already talk about climate change, okay? So glossaries sometimes that um, are made in the global west do not fit the global south. I will give you an example. In my own community in Nigeria, we have been describing climate change when um, storm water flooding happens. We say the river gods are angry and that they are angry because some people went and dug up sand, sand mining. So your job as a journalist or a commissioner, wherever you are, is to help the people connect the dots with their actual reality in the languages and the uh, metaphors that they understand. Um, we have market days where to prevent over farming and over fishing, right? So it's important commission believers do the basic climate literacy, but you also have to ask already what the situation is in terms of climate reporting. And finally, I will say 
journalists here need to understand that you don't have to be the reporter on the ground or hire the reporter on the ground full time because it can be expensive. You must, however, have reporters at the planning stage of your story and at the end of your story to vet the nuances. If you can't engage them at least full time, try and engage them part time. Thank you. And um, to you, Peter, you work for a green tech nonprofit, and um, your mission is to, to um, close the gap that still remains so we can reach net zero emissions by 2050. So that's, that's a big goal and, and you, you do um, a lot of research and work behind that. Um, but you also work with journalists. Can you tell us a bit more, how can we connect the dots between your work as a clean tech organization and journalism? Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for, for having us here as outsiders on this panel. First of all, I, I think a lot of important things have been said already, but maybe as a bit of context, so we work exclusively on the hard to abate sectors. So we only work on those things where the share of emissions is very high and technologies are in early stages, early TRLs, we call them, technology readiness levels. Sectors like these include the cement industry, include long duration storage, include aviation. There's no technology yet to, to solve aviation quickly. Um, and in this field, yes, we work with journalists. And we've, we've, we've found out that it's very, um, it's very fruitful, hopefully, because we can provide technical advice, independent technical advice, to put the stories into context. And adding to uh, the points uh, Alexandra has made, I would like to add probably from our perspective, but it's limited to these technological sectors. There's a lot of other nuances, as all of you know, on reporting on climate change. But when it comes to assessing solutions, in particular, innovators, entrepreneurs, startups, research consortia, it's very good to have proportion. So to always know what you're talking about. I'll give another example. Say there's, an, there's a startup or there's a research consortium and there's going to be a report, a news story, a TV report or something. Put it into context. Are we talking about 5% of emissions? Or are we talking about 0.0.05% of emissions? How far is this? Cross-check the story. Is this, is this a technology that's really needed? Or is it basically just a way to get public funding and maybe uh, lure some investors into the seeding round or the, the, the A series or so? And, and in this context, uh, I see a lot of very dedicated journalists out there, so both in the, in, the, in, the, in the German and European space, but also beyond, we've been in contact with a couple of them. Um, and, and another thing I'd like to stress, what I find very encouraging is addressing the mass audiences. So, for example, with the story on cement, we've made it to Saturday Night News, like last year before the COP, we went to COP27 in, in Egypt, and th the feedback we got was way more rewarding than publishing something in, a, in an expert magazine where everybody's talking about these things all the time. And I know a very impressive German journalist, I just spoke to her today, she'll be speaking at the festival tomorrow, who is addressing the mass TV audiences with these things. So that's important. And, and of course, all these other things my colleagues here uh, mentioned come into play. Use the right words, use the right metaphors, very important. Use a scale everybody can understand. Sorry for the long answer. Mm, thank you so much. So, um, Rona, you at the, at the Solutions Journalism Network, you work with um, four pillars that make a criteria, like good criteria of a good story because, you know, bringing your points together, viewers is like, so what does a good climate story that also looks at solutions contain? Like, how, how can we approach that as journalists? So first of all, it's very critical. It's not uh, sugar and spice, everything's nice. Um, you need to work with the evidence or the lack of evidence. So um, reporting on the success or the failure of that solution. Um, you need to have a specific solution. You have to have a response. You talk about the limitations. Um, when it's constructive, you have to throw it forward with some elements of debate. And what I've noticed is um, this structural way of debate where people have to be, have to look a certain way, probably wear blue and jackets, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, sit in a studio and talk to each other, that's also a silo. 
Um, I think in our everyday news, we have to look at the debate. And it doesn't have to be anything more than on a, on a, on, on a newspaper page, have two people's pictures facing each other and what they've said to each other. So for example, if I were doing a story, I encourage journalists a lot. I would first of all talk to you, Lisa, the person who is on the receiving end of maybe the effects of the climate change or the solution. And then I would go to the person who is in charge of the solution. And I would say, this is what a typical, these are the questions a typical person has. The debates do not have to happen in the same room. We always seem to forget that debates do not have to mean two people in one place poking each other's eyes out. Um, sometimes it's physically impossible, you know? So we have to adapt our reporting realities to the realities of our audience. People are not, young people are not going to sit in the streets and waste their time talking to politicians, for example. You've got to bring these two audiences together. The people in the villages are not going to come and talk to people in Berlin. Um, so I think we need to focus more on the debate angle because it is one thing to report on whatever is going on. But if in your story people are not able to talk to each other, the main characters that are affected are not able to talk to each other, then I think you might be failing. Thank you very much. So Alexandra, you pointed at it earlier, but what are good practices that news rooms are already doing that do good climate journalism? Like, what do they do differently? Yeah, two things. Uh, one thing is they really reflect on a climate journalism strategy. Um, because particularly in Germany, I can see that with, with uh, many newsrooms have climate uh, correspondents, reporters have had those for a very long time, environmental reporters, because the environmental movement is, is, is pretty old around here. But uh, that is so tempting because then, then newsrooms say like, oh, you know, she's always been doing this great job or this has been taken care of by him he's an expert he's super and and that really keeps them from strategically thinking uh, where do we want to go with our climate coverage what are all the strategic elements and uh, most importantly which is always important from the strategy work I'm, I'm doing with other newsrooms uh, how do we really measure success? How do we measure if our journalism is successful? And it's not enough to look at the metrics and say, oh, do we have conversions or whatever, but you really need to think about criteria for success and way too often, and, and that uh, came up in quite a few interviews we did actually, way too often newsrooms think that award-winning journalism is great journalism, is successful uh, journalism, journalism that works, but uh, some, some of my interview partners really said, this is a puzzle to us, the, the journalism that wins awards doesn't have an impact with people, it doesn't, very often it doesn't present even, even great numbers, but the journalism that really works with people, sometimes short form video that works with young people like the, the Deutsche Welle uh, examples, that never wins awards really, because it's just, you know, for, for an awards ceremony, it's, it's just not elaborate enough. So, so that is a contradiction in, journal, in journalism that we really uh, have to think about. So, so that's the, the strategy part that, that newsrooms really need to be aware of. Off. And then obviously the audience part, and I mentioned that a lot, like that you have to really reflect who do I want to reach, who are our audiences that we want to reach, and how do we go about this, where are the platforms uh, that they are using. Thank you, and we really uh, want to give some time to audience questions, so I'd love to do one a quick round. I'm starting with you, Peter. One thing you would take, um, you would give with our audience that they can do differently tomorrow in doing better climate coverage? That's a pretty big question. Um, so, so, well, f f yeah, focus on what's relevant. So ideally, I mean, don't, don't buy into any uh, bait that's thrown at you saying, hey, we have the best technology in the world, it's gonna you know, solve everything, or, uh, or don't, 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 don't fall into this day-to-day, -day, I, I take it at the climate conferences at the COPs, reporting hysteria, oh, this country has neglected that, so everything is bad, and as you said, doom and gloom, the world's gonna, gonna, gonna go under completely, but, but rather think long-term and think, okay, which are relevant stories, 
and have them cross-checked, have them by whatever sources. And, and another th sorry thing I'd like to add also concerning to previous comments is transparency. Give the sources. We, we have a series with Handelsblatt, for example, a German newspaper, business newspaper. We always, I mean, we do briefings for them. We, we always give the whole story, all the sources, all the, all the scientific sources, and everybody can challenge them, but I guess that's the most sober and best way to go about it. Yeah, I don't want to take up much more time. Just think about it strategically, not uh, as a matter of single great stories, but really uh, what's the job that your climate journalism is supposed to do and how do I know success? I think uh, successful climate reporting uh, takes into account the difference between climate and weather. So climate is over a longer period as opposed to the weather of the day or the week. Therefore, I would say please invest in being able to use free open source uh, techniques. I'll give an example. Somebody was writing a story on sand mining, how bad it is and the climate change is making things worse in African beaches. But then I said, why don't you go to Google Maps and check over a certain period? And we could actually see exactly the damage over a longer time. And that um, part of the story was clicked on more and we moved it up on the page. So that was where people, that was the entrance into the story. So please invest in, they are free, invest in um, uh, catchy ways to actually bring out the climate in climate change and simplify, um, uh, clarify, do not simplify. So there's a big difference. I can say Angela Merkel is a woman who was president of Germany and she's 69 years. I've given you a lot of information. Or I can say Angela Merkel uh, was Germany's um, first president that was, that has a quantum, holds a quantum physics degree. Um, she revolutionized diplomacy in the world. There's a difference in this thing. So clarify with the same space you, you used to have information. Don't just simplify. Those would be my tips. Thank you so much. And now to you and the audience, do you have any questions to our panelists? I think there is a mic we can, we can give around. Yeah, a question down here. Yeah, just <laughs> changes in West Africa and South, South Asia, right? Is there anything that can be done to pressure the uh, broadcasters, as it were, on organizations like the European Space Agency to clarify the, the, the details of, of, because they have the data and uh, storytelling is then more fact-based rather than just a conjecture or a summarized. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that was the, the, the final point I made on the seven suggestions. Uh, collaborations will be so much more important, collaborations across the globe, but also with, with data providers. Uh, I mean, there's an Irish case that we have in our story. They have a climate uh, data uh, dashboard on their homepage that is, they collaborate with their electricity providers. How is in every minute, you know, you can see how Ireland's electricity is produced. You really need to find partners because you can't really have have all the data or, or uh, get, get all the data yourself as a newsroom. That's probably too much to ask, particularly for a regional newsroom. But there are data providers, and, and this is a very good example for, for these collaborations. How is it for you, uh, Pierre, when you moved into the kind of space of journalism first? Like, was it easy to kind of start collaborating? 
It basically, yes. I mean, I, I had, the, had the impression we were welcomed with open arms. And, and regarding the question of the gentleman, I, I think it takes somebody in a team, ideally if there's a newsroom or if there's a, a dedicated crew to covering that, to identify and prioritize and sort of what is relevant. I was receiving earlier this year information from, from WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, and, and other sources of such visualizations, and that they, like the, 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 the number of climate related extreme events is so high, they don't, they hardly know how to prioritize sometimes themselves. So, for a news, newsroom located in, in Africa or in South America, they should probably identify. Another key point I would add to my list is the tipping points. So you all have heard probably of the tipping points in the climate systems. Some of them we're about to reach, some of them we have reached already, some are a little farther away, luckily. But uh, yeah, prioritizing amongst the excellent data also uh, of, of NASA, uh, the US Space uh, Administration, is like wonderful, I mean, I shocking, but great data. I mean, I would also add that um, power speaks to power, so if you have to be, to be a bit, to, to speak from the reality of some journalists, especially some of us here in Germany. Um, if a freelancer or a small newsroom approach this big organization, they might not respond to you ever. Um, so I think what would help is actually approaching the chapter of your um, Dutch uh, German Journalism Association I can see myself actually going to one of our regional meetings and saying, hey, um, can you guys write an official letter? These are the email addresses, can you, because you know we need this uh, data. So going through associations, journalism associations that have existed for years, that are reputable, is also great. Um, going through uh, social corporations, I think is one way to do it, so that um, they know they have to answer you more or less. So that's what I would suggest. Is there another question? Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And my question was related to the role of motions in, um, in reporting about climate change. Uh, fear has been mentioned, hope as well. And I was wondering about anger, because as you also suggested, it was a very like a tipping point as well, when all the climate movement started gaining more attention, and anger was like very important into fueling this movement. So I was wondering, what's your take? I mean, that's a very um, good point. So the anger actually, runs through even the journalists that report. Um, that anger manifests, manifests itself when um, there's a whole bunch of data and nobody's explaining it like the gentleman uh, rightly pointed out. Um, we've also seen anger come from, of course, the people who are bearing the brunt. But we've started to see anger, which is very important, from sections of the world that say we do not produce all these emissions, why do we have to suffer for the industrialized world? So I say this to point out that I think anger is actually a great theme, lens from which to report on climate change. I think there has not been enough reportage that tackles that part of the anger, the ones who, who produce more and the ones who suffer more versus the ones who suffer more. I think polarization has begun to happen and taking on that anger those themes of anger will actually help us as journalists. Thank you for, for that. I, I have some notes already in my head. You go first. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, thank you so much to, to, to hi uh, for highlighting the, the, the emotion part. And I want to, like, anger is, is definitely important, but also what, what I briefly mentioned, humor, which is, you know, laughing together, because you need also need to attach emotions uh, to, to the solutions part. And uh, actually, the University of Colorado also does experiments with uh, incorporating climate communications. Actually, they have a project with a theater department. And uh, just because sometimes you just need a little bit of a lighter approach. And also, the reason why comedy works is, for example, uh, people very often, including myself, feel very guilty about their 
you know, climate related behavior, like when I step on a plane or what, whatever, and every, lots of people feel guilty about that. But when you're in a comedy show and then, you know, people can laugh about their own behavior and then they look around, they feel others laugh too, so we all feel guilty. And that's a step, yeah, that's a step closer to, to the solution because it's like, yeah, really, we are not really doing this well, but hey, you know, we can laugh about ourselves, but now, Let's go get to action, other than building up this wall of resentment, like, you know, denial. denial. Humor is, is, a, is really a way to, to transcend denial and, and really get the barriers down to, to action. Um. Thank you. I have two more thoughts on this, and I like the question. I think anger, anger is a huge resource of power, but it's really hard to beat when it's combined with a scientific basis. And we've seen that in Germany three, four years ago when Fridays for Future movement really kicked off. A situation, I guess, that's never been there, where usually if there was uproar from the youth movement, it was an emotional uproar against the calm, against an adult world, a grown-up world, that tried to calm them down with sort of rationality and scientific arguments. But this way, it was the other way around. It was an uproar with the scientific community against an, a grown-up world that was, especially in Germany, I know what I'm talking about, defending their diesel engines, defending their whatever, you know? And, and that was so powerful, it was hard to resist. So the combination of anger with, with the scientific basis and, you know, not going the violent road, but voicing the anger, but not destroying things, that's the best way. Okay, thank you very much. To be mindful of our time, I would stop here, but maybe just approach us afterwards with the other questions that you have. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>